Okay, good. Official good morning to everyone. Uh, really nice to see you all. Uh, very glad you could, could join this morning. I, I anticipate there'll be a few fresh faces maybe joining for the first time. And if that's you, welcome. And uh, if you're returning, uh, really great to see you again. We just had a fantastic time at Kingdom Builders Retreat, those of us that were there over the weekend in the Hunter Valley here in New South Wales. So uh, thank you so much to everyone that made the effort to come across. Uh, just speaking to Jared a moment ago, and I had the chance to catch up with Jared and his wife, Sal. That was, that was great. And Paulie and a whole heap of guys. In fact, there are a number of people I've become friends with on this particular platform that I finally got to meet in person. So that was, uh, that was a treat for me. So appreciate it, guys. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, now, this morning, I kind of want to make a bit of a prompt start because uh, the person I've asked to share this morning I met a few weeks ago. In fact, I'll give a little bit of context. Uh, very a close friend of mine, Louisa Sibajat, uh, who has shared on here before, actually. A lot of you would know Louisa. She is just one of, I think she's just one of the heroes in our church and just in life in general, to be honest. Uh, Louisa had invited me, invited me a couple of times, actually, or mentioned to me a couple of times, like, you've got to come and uh, come to this particular event uh, and hear this guy at Where's Home. And I'd looked Wes up, looked at some of his stuff and was definitely interested. And anyway, uh, Louisa locked me into attend, attend an event. It was actually the week after uh, we had all that crazy rain. So uh, been, been a builder as well. I had to go and fix a leaking roof that morning. <laughs> Just sort of what you have to do. But um, I ended up heading in into the city and sort of came in a little bit flustered thinking, Look, it just wasn't the most convenient week for me to be at this event, but uh, I got in the room and Wes was sharing. And I, I don't say this lightly, but in about the first five minutes, I was just glued. Now, you know, being a pastor as well, we sit and we listen as a pastor to, you know, I'm in church all day Sunday. We listen to a lot of people speak. And I've got to admit, I, I was just locked in for pretty every session right throughout the day. Uh, Where's his content, his his faith? I was I was challenged. I was challenged as as a Christian, as a pastor, as a businessman. Um, but I also just could not take notes fast enough. And uh, I was very fortunate as well. Off the back of that, Louisa introduced me to Wes, and uh, I was thinking, gee, I, I really want to get Wes sharing with this group, and uh, just yeah, uh, I, I just know it, it was such a blessing to me, and I. I've been listening to a stack of Wes's stuff on YouTube since then and had the opportunity just to, to connect as well. So Wes, want to wish you the biggest welcome to Business Connect this morning, mate. We're really thrilled to have you with us. And uh, thank you so much for making the time. Uh, feel free if you'd like just to um, unmute, maybe say hi so you pop up for people on their screens. Well, good morning and uh, yeah, good day. Uh, thank you, Dan, and thank you, Andrew, for the invitation. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure that you guys invited me. I, it's a real delight that I get to share with you this morning. Um, I love it, mate. I'm, I'm just going to hand to you and let you go for it, Wes. Um, I want to give you as much time as possible. So uh, over to you, mate. Let's make him feel very welcome on the chat and uh, really expect him for what you're going to bring in the next few, uh, few minutes. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so... <clears throat> Uh, just a little bit about my story, only because I want to give you some context. I know that's not the fun part or, or probably why you jumped on, but uh, I'm half English, half Australian. I've spent most of my life here, so I guess mostly Australian. Um, and, uh, and I didn't grow up with a faith at all. Um, in fact, I really had no idea who God was at all. It was never, it was never part of the conversation. Um, it was... Uh, I probably went to church twice for a christening or something like it was it was really nothing for me and um, and I kind of grew up in one of those homes where you know on the outside they looked like they had it all together but on the inside it was a disaster and uh, you know split parents and those sort of things and um, but that can build a phenomenal resilience inside of us if we choose to kind of see things that way and then in, a few years later uh, my mum found a partner and we moved to Australia and uh, when you land in a foreign country, I was 14 years old. I didn't know anybody. It builds a phenomenal resilience inside of you. And, uh, and then fast forward, I went back to London in 99 and started my first official business. And it was a window cleaning company. 
and uh, I really enjoyed it. Like we, we were really green. We had no idea what we were doing. It was just me and my best buddy uh, out cleaning windows. Uh, he, he had had some experience cleaning windows. I had none, figured it wouldn't be too hard, learned how to do it by Smoko on the first day and then our business was launched. And uh, we did that for about two and a half years. Um, and then somebody offered to buy our business from us, buy our window cleaning round, which of course the answer was yes. And I realized you make more money selling a business than you do running it. And so, uh, so from there, we went and built another window cleaning business and sold it, um, had a turf delivery business, had a garden maintenance company, moved back to Australia, had a window cleaning business, uh, had, to, uh, had a business where I brokered technology, telecoms. And, and really for me, all I wanted to do when I was younger was start businesses. So start businesses, learn. I just wanted to go through that real big learning phase and then sell it. And, uh, and to date, I've built and sold eight companies spanning professional services, franchising, financial services, uh, telecoms and trades. So it's been a really good, interesting time to learn. And, and I'm super grateful for that, for those learning years. But along that way, uh, this young girl one day was bold enough to say to me, you should come to church. And I remember thinking, righto, that was it. That was my decision. Righto, I'll go. And uh, uh, I was probably searching at the time for something, <clears throat> but I, I wouldn't have known that at the time. But uh, I went to church on, on the first day I ever went and, uh, and literally fell in love with God within about three seconds of being in church. And but that'll mess with you, right? When in my worldview, my worldview prior to becoming a believer was business was just there to serve me, give me everything I want. You know, if I want a bigger house, build a bigger business. If I want another car, build a bigger business. Um, like the, the, the kind of like the, the social engineering, if you like, that I had been exposed to in the world was that it was all about me. And, and, and if I can be totally honest with you guys, it was not a foreign thought to me when I was a young guy to think I'll start a business, I'll make loads of money, I'll probably trade in my first wife because that'll fall apart and then I'll get another one. Like that, it, it, like now, now I, I couldn't think of anything worse. But at the time before coming to Christ, that was like a, a total, there's a standard reality for, for the people in this world. And then, of course, I became a believer and I started pouring through the scriptures and my world fell apart because I started reading about a way of doing business that was nothing like the world that I had been in. Started pouring through, you know, Leviticus and, and reading about the Jubilee cycle and how to look after the widow and how to look after the poor. And I'm thinking, this is not how our world operates, but this is how God wants us to operate. And so basically it became an absolute mission to work out how does God want us to operate? How does God plan to redeem the marketplace? And, and, and ultimately, how do we play a part in that? And so that's basically from, so from, from that moment to today, that's been an you know, ever you know, quest for me to try and understand it. Uh, and then, of course, and then, of course, live it out. And God's amazing, right? Because I literally went from that worldview to to becoming a believer and having to shift the way I operate my businesses and the whole ethos of the business. And then God brings me an amazing wife. Uh, and now I've got three beautiful daughters who are 12, 7 and 4. And uh, and and we are thick as thieves. Uh, I've, I've got the best family in the world. I know you may think that you do, but you don't. Uh, I've got the best family in the world and, 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 and I just love them. And they're all girls. So I'm not sure what the Lord's trying to show me with the all girls thing, but I'm sure I'll work it out at about the time that they want to get married. So, so that's a little bit of the, uh, that's a little bit of the, of the story, I guess, you know, my shortest seminar is normally two days. So I've got now about, 37 minutes to cover off on some topics so like I was saying before we actually officially started I did actually go and binge watch the last six or seven of these connects that you guys have done just to kind of get an understanding of of the level of teaching and it's amazing that the the content that you guys are going through is so amazingly practical um like I, I literally went right back to the first one of this year, which I think is the one that Andrew did. And it was, it was so foundational to keep you back to what matters. And so 
So I, having heard all of that, I don't just want to kind of copy the same stuff. You know, um, I, uh, I kind of wanted to just pick a few things that were slightly different. And as much as I would love to be on here and teach you how to create a Facebook ads campaign that drives traffic to your website and converts them all so that you can hire more people and make more money, as much as I would love to do that, because that's my day job, I think we'll stick to some more spiritual stuff uh, on here. So I've got five lessons down here. I don't know that I'll get through them all, but, but we'll see how we go. Um, the first concept, I guess, for me, that is really important is, and these are our own words, it's the concept of the two operating systems that are at war in this world. And I call them kingdom versus Babylon, right? And, and although Babylon finished many, many years ago as a country, as a people group, the culture of Babylon still reigns today. And it's not a new thing. Um, in, in fact, the concept of Babylon precedes Babylon because you could go right back to Cain and Abel. And you could see Cain and Abel, the first time that two entrepreneurs are asked to give an offering. It's the first encounter. And God says, bring an offering. <clears throat> and as you know, one brings the best fat portions and brings them as an offering. And the other brother brings just a few tatty veggies to the table. And what does God say to the brother that brings their veggies? He says, sin is crouching at your door and you need to rule over it. God actually says to him, it wants to devour you. What's the sin? What, what is it that, that was going to get hold of him? It was self-interest. See, one brother was like, it all came from God. I'm happy to give it back to God. I'll just give it to God. The other brother was like, no, it's mine. I've worked hard. I want to keep it, blah, blah, blah. So, <clears throat> so, um, so right there, we see the concept of kingdom versus Babylon playing out, right? We see we see the two different motivations that we can have as kingdom entrepreneurs. Fast forward to Noah. <clears throat> Noah's asked to build an ark. It takes, we don't know exactly, but about 60 to 70 years for him to build the ark. Um, so you, you think you suffer persecution when somebody puts an angry face on your Facebook post. Imagine building an ark for 60 years and everyone thinks you're a loony. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, God floods the earth, 40 days, 40 nights. It takes about one year for the rain to subside. For, for the rain starting to them being able to get out of the ark is about a year. And then, um, and then Noah's biggest test comes, I believe. I believe the test that comes after the ark was bigger than the test that was create the ark. When God, God's instructions to Noah were release all of the animals, Right? Now, Noah at that point owned all the wealth in the world. The only thing that had any value was animals, and Noah had all of them. And God says, give them all away. He didn't say give 10% of them away. He said, give them all away. And Noah did it. So fast forward three generations, and we get to, we get to Noah's grandson called Cush. And Cush has a son called Nimrod. And I'm sure you've read about Nimrod. Nimrod, uh, was, Nimrod was a mighty warrior, right? Made that way by God. Physically tall, physically strong, military-minded, intimidating guy. And because he was meant to be that for God's kingdom, but he turned around. And he, and he warred against God. And Nimrod set up modern-day Babylon. And, you know, as you read the story, Nimrod's first genius idea was to build the Tower of Babel, build a tower higher than the water line of the flood because he was basically saying i'm bigger than god i'm better than god it's that self-interest again played out massively <laughs> and uh and 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 so he sets up babylon and and that event that his altercation where he decided to turn away from god happened in in, in what in modern day syria is about the location and then his 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 kingdom of self-interest um socialist kind of agenda ended up kind of enveloping the whole countryside it went north and west or east around the world and enveloped everything and, and even though babylon as a country and a people group is gone the concept is still here we we have a world today that is that is that is operating on self-interest an entire world today that is me first and everybody else later and yet, that is the complete opposite of how we are called to run, right? You know, like, like so, so let's bring that to something that's practical. 
our businesses that we run or steward, whatever kind of role you get, our businesses are firstly to advance the kingdom of God. Our businesses, our proprietary limited, our law mowing business, our, our accountancy, our dog walking business, whatever we're in, that is an asset. We've got to view our businesses as an asset of the kingdom that's first purpose is to advance the kingdom of God. Because anything short of that means that it must be self-interest, right? And self-interest, that culture of self-interest is the very thing that, you know, God has been warring against since he first created Adam and Eve. You know, and, and, it, and this is, you know, if, even right up to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were like the, the biggest group of people that were into self-interest right? You know, selling salvation, selling healings, which is why Jesus comes along and does it for free, you know, and then upsets them because then they can't charge for them. So, um, so I think in our mind, we've got to always be checking our heart around what is our intent? Is it self-interest or is it first an interest of the kingdom of God? See, so we all know the scripture that says, seek first the kingdom of God. The beautiful thing about that is that there must be a second if, if, if the instructions are to seek first, then there must be a second and a third. And so it's okay. It's okay to want to have things from your business, right? But that's got to be a seek second. Seek first would be, I want to use my business to be insanely profitable, to, to love on my clients, love on my suppliers, love on my team, give people an expression of the kingdom of God, and then build a business big enough that I have the influence of the ear of my community. If we can aim for those three things, highly profitable, give people that touch our business an expression of the kingdom, and then build a business that's impacting enough that we get the ear of the influences in our communities, towns, and countries, then, then we will finally be the voice that we need to be in Australia and beyond. Every country could have that, right, if, if, we, if we took that seriously. And so I guess what falls behind there is an obligation, it's an obligation to build a, big, a business bigger than you're comfortable, right? It's okay to build a business to the point where you get everything you want in life, plus you can give 10% away. That's not hard. Well, it might be hard, but it's swimming in the shallow end of the pool. Once you've got what you want and you've set yourself up and you've got a little bit and you're funding your churches and you're doing good works, you should still be building, still be building. There's no limit to God in what he can bring to, your to the table still building because irrespective of the money, irrespective of the money, you need a bigger business because the world system puts on a pedestal entrepreneurs that build big businesses. And the minute you get a bigger business, you get the ear and the influence of the people around you. It's, it's like if it's, if it's seek first the kingdom of God, then we can't tap out just because we've made enough money or we feel like we're contributing well or we're tired. Like just you know, when your time's up, just, just burn out like a candle. Okay. That's probably not advice from a good counselor, but it's kind of how I view it. All right. The second kind of thing I've got is, <clears throat> is if you read, uh, if you read Exodus 17, 12, you, you know, the story, it's the story of Moses and Joshua. Joshua's going to battle and Moses is up on the hill. And God says, every time you raise your hands, Moses, Joshua will be winning the battle. And every time you drop your hands, Joshua will start losing the battle. And they go through that a few times. And then what happens? Uh, Aaron and Hur come along. They put a rock under him and they hold up Moses' arms so that he can keep them up because he's tired. And Joshua goes on to win the battle. That right there is a picture of the symbiotic relationship between the marketplace and our spiritual covering, right? So the marketplace being us, we're out in the marketplace all day, every day, doing business, transacting. Our spiritual coverings, you know, which for me is my local pastor. I actually have two because I've got such a relationship from the pastor that I had for 15 years prior that I've got a great relationship with him. I've got a great relationship with my current pastor. And then we have paid intercessors on staff who get alongside of us and kind of play that role as prophet slash intercessor. And we have those on team. So I've got those spiritual coverings who are out there effectively as an act of warfare for me. And, and 
And, and so here's the thing, right? Can you imagine, can you imagine how crazy it would have been for Joshua, who's down in the battlefield, to just decide, oh man, it's hard down here. This is so hard. This is, it's sweaty, it's hot, there's blood everywhere. I'm killing people. I'm going to go and hang out with Moses. That sounds like a, a much, much easier job. I'm going to go up on the hill and hang out, you know. Can, can you imagine how good he'd be at being a spiritual covering? And what would happen to the army, right? They've got no leader, no direction. The whole thing falls over. It would be just as crazy for Moses. Can you imagine Moses, right? He's like a million years old and he's tired. And imagine Moses saying, stuff it. I'm going to go down there and put a sword on and I'm going to go and fight with Joshua, right? He would take one foot on the battlefield and he'd be gone. So, so we have to learn to play in position. Ours is the marketplace. Our spiritual covering is our spiritual covering. And when we work together, it is ridiculously powerful, right? So our spiritual coverings, right? So, so for those of you who are part of the Hillsong family, you've got a massive blessing that you may take for granted. I don't know. And that's Dan. Dan, you know, your, your stewardship pastor who's out there praying for you, meeting with you, interceding for you. You've got Andrew who's, I don't know, I don't know what Andrew calls himself as, as part of the organization, but he has a spiritual authority o- o- over this business group. Like that is such a powerful position, right? And obviously for those of you who are also, you've got Brian and Bobby, two of possibly the best leaders in the world, you know, who, who are out there advocating for you too. So that's them doing their job, but what's our job? Our job is when our spiritual covering is strong and we win the battle, we go into business, we become profitable, we've got more money. Our job is to then bring those spoils back to make sure our spiritual coverings are strong. Our job is to is to be profitable. Remember, they're, they're doing their bit. They're praying for us, active spiritual warfare, standing the enemy down. Therefore, we win more in business. When we win more in business, our job is to then take those spoils and make sure our spiritual covering strong. Funding churches, funding projects, funding programs, holding up the arms of our spiritual overseers, right? We, we've got a massive disconnect across the body of Christ between those two roles. I mean, outside of the Hillsong family, there are others that are doing a, a, an okay job of, of validating and praying for the entrepreneurs. And then the vast majority of entrepreneurs have just been forgotten about. If we can just get those two parties back to the table to, to work together, then the kingdom will be unstoppable financially, powerfully. You know, you can imagine it, it, it's, it's very rarely going to be the, the pastors who have influence in the community. It's going to be the business people that have influence in the community. But of course, once they've got the relationship, they can bring the pastors to the table, right? And start to bring some shepherding and, you know, changing policy and those sort of things that ultimately we need so that we don't get half of the rubbish that's going through the world today. But, but I guess you guys have, you've got a spiritual covering that's over the top of you. The bit I want to emphasize is you have an obligation to make sure that your spiritual coverings are well-funded which means that you are probably going to have to go without, right? You're probably going to have to go without to make sure that your spiritual coverings go with. The last thing you want to have is a spiritual covering that cannot be a spiritual covering because they don't have enough funding to be able to be a spiritual covering, right? That's, uh, that's effectively stealing in the kingdom of God. If your spiritual covering is doing warfare for you, so that you do so that you prosper more in business but you don't reward your spiritual covering with the spoils of war you're effectively taking from the kingdom of god and not seeking first apologies if this is a bit of an uppercut i know it's early but i always look at it like this i might have i might have 40 minutes with you for the rest of my life so i want to say something that impacts you and maybe even if you don't like it um I want to talk about the transfer of wealth for a minute. The transfer of wealth is such a cool topic. Um, God has always wanted the transfer of wealth from the wicked to the righteous. He's always wanted it. From the very, 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 very beginning of the Bible, God wants the wealth to be in the hands of the righteous. Why? Why would he want that? Well, when the wealth is transferred from the wicked to the righteous, the righteous use it for good means. The righteous will build churches, build programs, build homes, shelters, right? You know, like like things that actually matter in society, right? 
that's the beauty of the wealth. You know, like, like, if, like when the wealth is transferred to the righteous, we are not limited by economics. We are limited by vision. Like we don't, ha- when the wealth of the wicked is transferred to the righteous, we don't have to do things that economically make sense. We can do things that don't make sense, but they seek first the kingdom of God. Let me just throw a random example out there, a random example. For those of you who are in Sydney, for example, I can guarantee you that there's a shortage of beds in hospitals. This is just one ridiculous idea that's probably not even real. There's a shortage of beds in hospitals. Now, there are people that are dying in the hallway, dying at home because they can't get to the hospital for beds, right? Can you imagine if the Christians got together because they'd been part of the transfer of wealth and they said, hey, mayor of Sydney, whatever, state member for Sydney, um, we would like to build a, uh, a hospital for you guys. We will build it. It's going to be the best, going to have the best technology inside of it. We're going to underwrite the whole thing, and we're happy to run it at a loss. In fact, if it's only ever got half the amount of people in it, it doesn't matter. We'll fund it at a loss because we want to give people the dignity of looking after them at the end of their life. That's what we want to do to serve the people. Can you imagine? Now, the difference between us doing that and not doing that is just money, right? So that's, that's why God's wanted the transfer of wealth, because you can do stupid things like that that don't make sense economically. But man, we'll be on the front page of the paper tomorrow. To, like, why would you do this? Why would you do this? Why would you do this? Well, let me tell you. So, so the transfer of wealth has always been something the Lord wants. And, and, and if you want an example of that, it's pretty much the Old Testament. <laughs> you can start there. Literally, can you imagine? God's instructions were, go and take over that city. And the instructions were typically something like, put them all to the sword. <laughs> put them all to the sword. And then it was, take all of their valuables and move to the next battle. That, that was God's instructions. Put them to the sword, take everything valuable and move on. And they went, literally, it went... For you know, thousands of years, just fighting, taking all of the valuables and moving on, because he wants the transfer of wealth. Um, in fact, there's one one case where he doesn't. Right? You remember after they cross over, they got Jericho, and he says, "In this case, I don't want you to take the gold bits and distribute them amongst yourselves. I want you to take all the treasures from Jericho, and I want you to put them in the treasury for the new country, which is going to be Israel in the Promised Land." Right? So. So fast forward to today, does God still want a transfer of wealth? You, you bet your bottom dollar. There is, there is more, there's more unrighteousness, you know, in its front and center today than, than possibly ever before. And so, but the reason why I bring that up today is because we are standing here or sitting in April 2021 with probably the greatest opportunity for the transfer of wealth that's ever happened in Australian history and global history in front of us. And let me quantify that for you. Treasury Australia, and this is the same, we, we also have the numbers for the UK and the USA, and the, I, have, I only really have the numbers for the developed world. But take Australia, Australian Treasury, our government department, have put out a report in the last, at the end of February, saying how much of the COVID stimulus money remains unspent. So out of all of the government stimulus money that was put into the Australian economy, they're able to pull a report on how much is in bank accounts that remains unspent. And as of February, so the number will be a little bit lower now because that money is going to be spent. But as of the end of February, Treasury reported that there is 200 billion, with a B, 200 billion of stimulus money that had remained unspent in Australia. Now, just to give you the context, they only put out 240 billion. So 40 billion was spent in COVID, like in the heat of COVID, and 200 billion remains. So right now, our economy and America put in 1.9 trillion, so crazy town. So the, and they've got 10 times as many people and they put in 10 times as much stimulus, give or take, right? So, so, so they've got a similar sort of picture. E- England would be on par. England gave a little bit less. Um, there's $200 billion right now becomes a land grab for us. So now do we do business? Like we should be getting up every single day and fighting for our share of that 200 billion so that we can take it from the hands of the wicked and bring it to the hands of the righteous so that we can start to fund projects that advance the kingdom of God. See, that'll get you up every day. What won't get you up every day is I want a new BMW. Well, that might get you up for one day, but that won't keep getting you up right? Apart from maybe a Ram, as I heard Andrew say before, which I have also just purchased. So welcome to the Ram Club. 
Welcome to the Ram Club. There is nothing better. I have to wait for mine though, a little bit, Andrew, which sucky, but anyway. Uh, so, so there is a caveat though to the transfer of wealth. I've probably, I've probably painted a really nice picture for you guys and got you a little bit excited about, um, about the transfer of wealth, but there is a caveat. The Bible says it's from the wicked to the righteous. It doesn't say the wicked to the believer. And so I think there's a distinction in how we operate as kingdom entrepreneurs. If we are seeking first the kingdom of God, if we are doing business to advance the kingdom of God, if we're sensing a duty as an ambassador called to the marketplace to do business, then if we're operating righteously and we're honoring people and we're, we're paying fairly and we're honoring the ATO and we're not trying to chip the ATO and, and we, you know, if we're operating righteously in our operations, in the small things, if we're not doing cash jobs and blah, blah if we're operating righteously, then we will be part of the transfer of wealth. If we're not operating righteously in our daily activities, we won't be part of the transfer of wealth. There, there will be, <laughs> the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. So, so we need to constantly be auditing ourselves about how righteous we are in our operations. And let me tell you, just to be, a, 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 here's an equalizer for every single one of us. We're all doing it wrong somewhere. No one gets out of this. So now that we can agree that we're all doing it wrong somewhere, our prayer to God should be, show me where I am not being righteous. Lord, show me where I'm not being righteous. And he'll pinpoint an area, and then it's your job to root that out and get rid of it and start operating righteously. If you were to be on a constant journey of doing that for the rest of your entrepreneurial life, you will become more and more righteous, which means you can be more and more trusted, which means that you'll get more and more of the transfer of wealth. But it comes down to us. It comes down to us. It's a hard prayer, but you got to remember, God's not upset by your sin. It's already been paid for, but he would like to get it out of your life. So, so in my experience, when I go to the Father and say, show me where my character is letting me down, show me where I'm unrighteous, he will, he will show me, not because he's condemning me, because he wants it out of my life more than I do. And then he does it in that really loving, kind way where he helps you through that journey. And then you, you end up better on the other end. So it, it can be a bitter pill to swallow, but, uh, but vital in my opinion. Uh, this one very, very quickly. Uh, this is not really a scriptural kind of thing, but something that's really heavy on my heart is family. Like I said to you, I've got four beautiful girls, a wife and three kids. It's so easy in this modern world to see them as different parts of your life, right? And the, the truth of the matter is, you know, if you've got a spouse and if you've got kids, I mean, if you don't, then, then, then it's probably your parents, if, depending on how young you are. But you've got to do family well. And the world need an example. The world need to see practitioners that you can build a highly profitable business and look after your health, and look after your family, and, you know, and, and, and balance, if you like, for a better word, the important areas of your life. And it, it, this is a big challenge, right? But to me, you, you can take every single one of my businesses away, and I'll take my family thanks, right? And in fact, I heard, I heard on one of the little videos from in the last however many months that I listened back, somebody was saying, it was a guy that's in hospitality. He was saying, he said to his wife, I think they went on a caravan trip and he said, we could do this. As long as we've got Jesus and each other, we could live in a caravan. And I'm like, I, I've, I fully agree that that's where we should get to. If I've got my family and a, and a caravan, and, and by the way, I did two and a half years in a caravan. So, so I, 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 I know how bad it is. Um, it's what matters. And, and so I guess I'm only bringing it up because we can see them we can see them as competing priorities in our life sometimes as entrepreneurs, like they're holding me back from building a great business, you know, or, or things like this. And all I want to say to you is they're actually the priority. And by honoring your family, you'll also receive honor from God in your business. You, you can't put your family to the side for 10 years to build a business to provide for them 
if you're not there for them. It doesn't work that way. You can, you can get out of balance for a short period of time. Like when I went around the country and did my momentum tour for seven days, right? Like, like I didn't, I mean, I rang them every day, but I wasn't really in my family's life. Like you can be out of balance for a period of time. If you're doing a massive launch or a deadline, you can sit down with your family and say, I'm going to be a bit absent for the next little bit, you know, week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever, whatever. And you can go away, but you've got to come back. And then you've got to make it up to them. And then you've got to love on them. And then you've got to really reward them and because they're ultimately they're the priority. And I guess I'm only bringing it up because I run the risk of going so hardcore business that you might catch that and run and forget the people that matter most. Now, now here's, here's where I find that it becomes a problem. I meet people who are running a business and running a family and volunteering 37 hours a week at church and playing golf with the boys and bowling on a Tuesday. And I'm like, you've spread yourself too thin, right? I mean, first of all, don't play golf anyway. If you want a happy life, if I say anything valuable, just don't play golf. You'll be happier if you don't play golf, right? Um, but when you, every time you add something in your diary, you add competing priorities. I know that if I was to add something else into my life, it would be my family that suffer. I'm not prepared to do that. So for me, my life is the most boring life in the world. I mean, I love it, but it's boring. I train every day at the gym. I love my family every single day. I build a business and I'm involved in my church. Anything else I don't do. Nothing else. Now, I'm not saying that's right, but for me, I know because my, my businesses, well, we've got five. My businesses, are, they're, they're heavy and they're hard and they're, they're all in and they take a huge amount of focus and attention. So if I add anything else in, it's going to be on the weekend and that's going to rob from my family and I'm not prepared to do that. So, so I guess all I'm really saying here um, is what you, you know, you'll give time to what you value most. And I would like to see family put up on a pedestal for the sole reason that the world needs to see that you can build a business and have a great life and look after your health and keep a family. And then they will realize that it can be done. One more thing before I finish up and hand back to Dan in about four minutes time. The parable of the meaners in Luke is one of my favorite stories. And, and, and this is how it goes. Um, it, it says a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive a kingdom for himself and then to return called 10 of his servants. He calls 10 of his servants and gave to them 10 minas and said to them, do business till I come, trade until I return. So how many servants did he give money to? 10. And then it, and then it goes on a little bit further. And, and when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants, how many? 10, to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man gained by trading. Then came the first one saying, master, my mina has earned 10 minas. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you are faithful with little, have authority over 10 cities. See, this is the game that we need to be playing. It's not about the minas. It's not about the wealth. It's about the influence. This person went from one mina to 10 minas to being put over 10 cities. When you do the right thing with worldly wealth, God will give you influence over what really matters. And that's people and communities and policy. The, the, this person who turned one mina into 10 and went over 10 cities, he sets the culture for those 10 cities. He, he, he gets to decide what is allowed inside those 10 cities. All right. Now, that's not even the bit I want to point out of this. Right. That's just a side note. The next person comes and says, here, master, your mina, I turned it into five. And he says, well done. I put you over five cities. And then as we know, the third one comes up and he says, um, well, I, I, I was scared of you. You're an austere man. You reap what you did not sow. I didn't do anything with it. Uh, I put, you know, I hid it, put it in a handkerchief. And um, basically I was scared. So here's your one mina back. And we know the master says to him, you know, out of your own mouth, I'll judge you, you know, and then he says, take it off the one and give it to the, the one that has 10. The bit that I want to pull from that story though, is the bit that's not written. So how many were given a mina? 10. How many gave a report? Three. And we always talk about the one that did nothing with it. But seven, seven never came back. Seven of the 10 were given a mina and they went and spent it 
on their own lifestyle. There was never a return for the master. They didn't care less about the master. They just went and blew it on whatever they wanted. So here's my question for you. God's put inside of you gifts and talents to be able to go into the marketplace, to create wealth, to, you know, to, to, to fund churches, to fund you know, your spiritual covering and, and have influence. And he's put inside of you an ability to do that. But along the way, along the way, the lure of wealth is going to be so strong that you are going to want to be tempted to spend it on yourself. Because the journey of business is so long and so hard that you're, gonna, you're either going to believe your own press or the enemy's going to lie to you that you've deserved it, you should have it all, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then towards the end of your life, there is a chance that you will turn around and there will be very little fruit for the kingdom of God. There'll be very little return for the mina that was put inside of you. If I can just leave you with one thought, one question, one point, it would be this. Please, please, please make sure that at the end of your entrepreneurial life, all the way through, but at the end, you can proudly say that God put a mina inside of me and I was able to return it and multiply it and give it back by producing fruit in the kingdom of God. God, I want to be one of the two out of the 10. I don't want to be one of the seven. It's been a delight hanging out with you this morning. Uh, and I'd love to connect with you in any way that you would like. Um, I'm on Instagram, so at Wes Hone, Wes with a Z. I'm obviously on Facebook like everybody else. And we have our own YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com uh, forward slash kingdom business, I think there's like 400 videos there of, of practical business training that you can get. In fact, Pat might just go and pop it in the chat for me now, the handle for, um, for, for our YouTube channel. Uh, Dan, back over to you. Uh, I just appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you guys. Apologies, guys. I'm struggling to find the mute button. Wes, that was absolutely sensational, mate. Thank you. I've seen so much encouragement coming through on the chat, and I'm sure people will continue to thank you. Uh, look, uh, I, I can't emphasize enough how Wes has so much content. As he, as he mentioned earlier, this was, he, he was, you know, two days is kind of generally what he does as a starting point. So jump in. I will I will email out the group as well, just ways to connect further with Wes. I, I put a couple of things in the chat, but I think it's been pushed up as well as this YouTube channel. Mate, thank you. Greatly appreciate that. Uh, yeah, we, we love it, mate. Thanks for your heart for, for the kingdom, your heart for the church, your heart for us as business people as well. Um, I wonder if you could pray for us, pray for us as a group. Um, uh, yeah, that'd be amazing, mate. 100%. Well, Father God, we just come before you and we just want to thank you, God. We, we love you so much. Um, we we want to reward what you did for us in return by doing a great job in the marketplace. Lord Jesus, uh, help us as we go into our business day with divine appointments. Help us to understand how we can love the one in front of us even more than we already do. Lord Jesus, show us areas of our lives where we can become more like you. Lord, we invite you in. We open ourselves up. We humble ourselves and become vulnerable enough for you to show us areas where we can root out the lies and replace them with your truth. Ultimately, God, it is a joy and a delight to serve you in the marketplace. And I want to thank you for Dan and Andrew and the Hillsong family and for everybody outside the Hillsong family that joined in on the call today. I pray a blessing over them as they head into their day and their week. Amen. Amen. Thanks again, Wes. We love you. We appreciate you. Thanks for everything you're doing. And uh, everyone, thanks for being part of this morning. We will definitely see you in church this weekend. And hey, if I can just throw the cheeky challenge out off the back of that, Wes was throwing a few uppercuts anyway, which I love, by the way, mate, refreshing and challenging and inspiring all at once. But I uh, really want to, I think for some of us, we just need to jump back in the groove of getting to church consistently, just make it part of our routine. And um, I, I've met a number of people at Kingdom Builders and you know, that good people who love Jesus, love the church, just seem like they're out of routine. And I just think for us, that's just as business people, let's be leading the way in the way we're leading our families into the house of God. And I think it'd be great. We really look forward to seeing you over the weekend. And uh, hey, we'll be back. We keep 
keep uh, going, same time, same place next week. Much love all. We will see you soon. Thanks again, Wes. Hey, thank you, Wes. That was brilliant, mate. Absolutely brilliant. The content was fantastic. And, um, and we love Blunt. We love Blunt. Blunt is good. <laughs> I look forward to catching up with you again another time soon, mate. Pleasure.